of Geneva, Switzerland. So it's a morning yes. for you. And uh, you will be talking to us about optimal finite time Carnot cycle. So Marty, the stage is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you hear me well and see the, the pointer? OK, uh, take this as a yes. <laughs> yes. OK, um, perfect. So what I will be presenting today is a joint work with uh, Paolo Abuso, who is a PhD student in Barcelona. So it was published here, most of uh, yeah, what, what I will discuss uh, last year. Let me also mention that also last year we did a kind of follow-up work, also together with Matteo Scandi and Harry Miller. And uh, with this, I go to the motivation, which uh, brings us back uh, almost 200 years ago by the seminal work of Carnot, which I cannot, of course, stress enough how important it is for thermodynamics and for uh, physics in general, because it gives us an upper bound in terms of efficiency of what can be done with a two thermal bath at different temperature. And indeed, the power of this result is the fact that it's universal, right? So um, it doesn't really matter what uh, the nature of the, what you are using as a working substance. Like you could do from a very nanoscale engine to a nuclear plant, but as long as you do the cycle correctly, then you know what the efficiency will be. And also, you know that this provides an upper bound to any possible cycle. Okay? But the price to pay is that it comes with a zero power because the, the steps are infinitesimally slow. So of course, this motivates the field of uh, finite time thermodynamics, which in a way is, motivate, is, is characterized by its lack of universality. Okay? So here, you really need to go into the details so you have to understand uh, which kind of working substance you have, which kind of control, and so on and so forth, in order to, to be able to say, let's say, what is the optimal cycle, or what, what is the best that I can do with my engine. So you really need to go into the details. But still, it's kind of nice, because nowadays, it's still a very active field Okay, after 200 years. Um, so. Let me just quickly uh, summarize how can we address this problem of finite time. So very uh, roughly speaking, there are two approaches. One is kind of a phenomenological approach where uh, you, you look at corrections to the ideal Carnot limit. For, for example, in the Carnot case, you would have that the heat is given by the temperature times uh, delta S, and you add some correction to this limit, okay? So you, you assume, for example, this is a time. <laughs> so you kind of introduce a, a finite time correction, but crucially you assume, so this, this sentence here, um, this information is contained in the coefficient lambda. Um, so basically you, you put all the, all the dynamics and all the complexity of the, of the system into a single uh, parameter, which is very convenient because then you can see what, I mean, fixing this, you can look, for example, at trade-offs of uh, power and efficiency. You can look at uh, yeah, kind of the allowed uh, values of, of efficiency. So this, this has been generalized in these papers, for example. And here the idea is that you have a wide applicability, okay? Because these, these uh, models are, they can be applied to, to many specific cases you get nice trade-off between power and efficiency. However, as I was saying, you are really missing a microscopic uh, description. And this is of course a problem because then if you really want to understand what can be done, like if, if, if someone comes and tells you, okay, I want to optimize this engine. Well, you really need to understand this in order to be able to give an answer, okay? So, so it's really, it's nice, but only a limited uh, answer. Then you can, in a way, take the, the opposite approach where you take a very uh, exact and, and precise description of what is going on. So usually then uh, one limits uh, itself to, to very simple cycles. 
So where the working substance is, for example, a two-level system where you have an harmonic oscillator so that you can really solve it and describe it uh, very well. And in this case, you can really solve everything. Okay, so you can find the maximum power and it gives you a, an understanding of what is the optimal cycle. You don't need to make any assumptions on the form or, or anything. However, what usually happens is that this optimization is very hard because you're optimizing actually over protocols. So as you would increase the size of the working substance, then usually they, they it becomes exponentially hard. Okay. So this is nice when you have very simple systems, but it gets harder as you go to, to larger ones. Okay. And what I will be presenting today is kind of uh, in between between these two approaches. So basically, um, I will be making some assumptions, but still keeping a microscopic description. Okay, so I will assume that uh, we are dealing with uh, finite time Carnot cycles. I will make some assumptions on the type of relaxation, but I mean, still very generic. So we have kind of Markovian dynamics. And crucially, I will also assume uh, slow driving. Okay, so I will assume, technically speaking, kind of linear response expansion on the driving speed. So why uh, is this important, this low driving assumption? Well, the reason is because you have then quite a lot of powerful tools to deal with, um, let's say the out of equilibrium dynamics that are given by this idea of uh, thermodynamic length that goes back to the seventies or eighties. And it's really a powerful uh, geometric approach to, to, to do this kind of uh, optimizations and, and to, let's say, deal with quite generic systems. Okay, so this is a bit the, the idea. So with this, I move to the cycle. So quickly speaking, let me just set the basics. So I will be consider a working substance, which is described by some Hamiltonian that can be externally driven. So one has control on, on this system. And furthermore, this can also be coupled to a cold bath and a hot one. And whenever it's coupled to a bath, uh, this will be described by a standard uh, Limblad uh, master equation, which has the Gibbs state as a fixed point. Okay, so this is all quite generic. Same for the definitions of work and heat. And then the Carnot cycle looks, looks like this, let's say in its quantum version, but it's really analog to the classical one. So the idea here, we have control on the Hamiltonian and we start at some point. And then this blue, it means that it's coupled to the cold bath. And while being coupled to the cold bath, we slowly move it to another point into the Hamiltonian space. Okay, and this in fact needs to be infinitesimally slow because we want that the system at each point of the trajectory is in a Gibbs state. Okay, because this ensures that the, there is no dissipation and that the work is simply began, given by the change of free energy between these two points. So we, we are free to choose this point actually. And then uh, what the next step is to disconnect the system from the cold bath and connect it to the hot one. And we want to do it in such a way that when it's connected to the hot bath, we are still at thermal equilibrium with the new bath. Okay, because we don't want any dissipation. And this can be done by, by this simple uh, rule. Okay, so we want mm, that when we drive the Hamiltonian and it's closed, at the end it satisfies this because you really you, you quickly see from the uh, form of the Gibbs state that then this will be in equilibrium with respect to the new bath. Okay. And it's important to notice that here when we are disconnected to the bath, I mean, this can really be seen as a quench. Okay, so as long as you have control on the Hamiltonian to kind of rescale it, then you can do this arbitrarily fast. Okay, so really the bottleneck of the of this cycle is here when you are in contact with the bath. Like when you are disconnected, this this is a, kind of a simple operation at least uh, theoretically, and then you go back. Okay, so you do another isotherm and another adiabatic. And you close the cycle and it's uh, pretty straightforward to see that the 
efficiency is given by the Carnot efficiency and that the power goes to zero because the time of these isotherms go to infinity. Okay, so even if the work output is finite, to, to, do the, to, to really get this efficiency, you need these times to go to infinity. Okay, so what will I be considering here? Well, I will be considering a finite time version of this where, as I was saying, I mean, this you can do perfectly, this quench, so I, I will keep this the same, but the isotherm, I will assume that it's done in finite time in such a way that your state is not quite the Gibbs state, but there is some finite time correction. And as a consequence, there is also some dissipation. Now, if you look uh, at, the, at the power and efficiency, well, now these times are finite, so the power is finite, but it gets some correction, uh, which crucially is path dependent. Okay, so because you see this reversible contribution, it only depends on the endpoints. But now this correction depends on what what is going on. Okay, it depends on the on exactly what you are doing here uh, in between. And the same for the efficiency. Okay, it also gets a, a finite time correction, and that is also path dependent. Okay, so now we want to optimize. We want to make this both figures as, as large as possible. So the, the well, the, let me um, introduce a couple more, more quantities. So, I mean, we had this dissipation, which is the correction to the reversible limit. And I, as I said, I will be working in this low dissipation or slow driving regime, which basically means that you can expand this uh, dissipation in powers of one over tau, where this tau is the time, and keep only the leading term. Okay, so strictly speaking here, you would get a term of order tau squared and so on and so forth, but I will only keep the leading term. And this is basically the entry production, uh, missing a beta factor here, sorry. But then you can rewrite these expressions as follows, and you get this quite compact form. The next thing, and so I'm now uh, jumping a bit ahead, but it will simplify the description, is to notice that for optimal protocols, I mean, this can be proven, uh, these two quantities, these two entropy, this, uh, the entropy productions, they obey a, a similar relation. So it depends a bit on the dynamics, but it happens for many systems that they are symmetric. Okay, so the, uh, the protocol is symmetric, and then you get them to be identical when you have the optimal protocol. If you have more generic open quantum systems, it was shown in this paper that you get this, this proportionality relation where this is the omicity. Okay, so, but basically let's stay for now with a symmetric case. Uh, and I mean, what I will explain can be generalized, but, but then for a symmetric case, you get this uh, simple and nice form and now we want to Sorry, indeed Mark, optimize. Sorry, could yes. you ask what is alpha in the second, like the for open? Yeah, so, so here, basically, I'm assuming that the bath is structureless, whereas here, uh, you assume that you have, uh, uh, say, a bosonic bath, which is uh, described by some omicity. So when alpha is one, you would get a standard omic back, bath, otherwise you can have superomic or subomic. And then you get this more generic expression in the optimal protocol. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have this expression for power. So the simple, the first step, which is simple but uh, very enlightening, is to uh, optimize over the time of the cycles. Okay, so this goes back to uh, uh, se seminal works by Smith and Seifert and also by Esposito where you basically say, okay, I want to maximize this quantity. So let me just see what are the optimal times so that this becomes maximum. And then you find these nice results. You get that this, the maximum power takes this expression and the efficiency is the coulson arbon efficiency, okay? Then you can say, okay, let me make this a bit more general because here you are, you only care about the power. Okay, and then you look at the efficiency and maximum power, but you could say, no, look, I don't want to sacrifice all the efficiency. This is too low for me. So let me say, I want a 90% efficiency in my device. Okay, so I, I, you take the, some, some value between zero and one, and, and 
ask your efficiency to be uh, yeah, some proportion of the Carnot efficiency. Well, in that case, you can do the same trick, okay? So you can uh, take the derivative of power with, with respect to the times and you get to this general expression, which is the maximum power for a given efficiency. And you can make uh, these nice plots. And so it gives you trade-offs between efficiency and power. So this is very nice, but as I was saying at the beginning, all the details of the cycles are hidden in this entropy production in this omega. And the other thing to notice that is quite nice is that if you look at the maximum power, regardless of, of, of your figure of merit, it always depends on this ratio. Okay? It only, always depends in the delta S squared divided by, by omega, by the entropy production. So just to... Re so, so delta S is basically this change between those, these two points, okay? Whereas the, the other, the, the dissipation is basically the, this extra dissipation that we are creating. So, so in a way you can see it like this. So delta S gives you the, the work output. So you want this to be very large, but you also want to make a very small dissipation. Okay, so this is the, the figure of merit that we care about. And now, well, all that is left to do is to optimize this over the, the protocols that, that we can do. But of course, this is a much harder optimization because now we are not optimizing about the scalar, but rather about the protocol. Okay, so we want to maximize this over all trajectories where you can, uh, in general, write a trajectory like this. So you have some control on the Hamiltonian so you can assume that in fact what you have what you have is some control uh, on some let's say you, so you have some control parameters that are time dependent this could be the frequency or it could be uh, some some parameter of the hamiltonian and then you have the associated uh, observables okay so there's been previous works that basically looked at a single qubit and so you can really, mm -hmm. I, the diario has raised his hand Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's somehow related to one of the um, first slides. I mean, can I see this? Uh, I mean, when you pass from, let's say, a single variable to a more, let's say, microscopic viewpoint, can I see it as a sort of, uh, let's say, again, a trade-off trade uh, between, let's say, universality and an understanding of what is happening? I mean, it looks like that when you pass to a microscopic description, somehow you give up a little bit the, the universality result, but you gain an understanding. So is it something on that? Not sure if I would, well, I mean, I'm not sure if I would agree. So in the sense that mm -hmm. I'm still keeping the same structure of the, okay. if you want the more or less universal results, but then what I want to give is also universal bounds on this, um, on this quantity, but they do depend, okay, and, and in the sense you are right, they do depend of course on the control that you have. Exactly. So from yes, that yes. point, you are going more to something, let's say, more tailored to the specific system you have, more than saying, okay, uh, this is the universal result. Yes, exactly. So in this okay. sense, yeah, I completely agree with you that the bounds that I will give will depend on the control that you have. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you, yeah. Thank you Dario. We have a second question from Jean Rock. Yes. It's, uh, uh, maybe I missed this part. So you assume that this entropy production in uh, hot simulation and the cold simulation to be equal, right? Uh, does yeah. this give like any constraint to the uh, trajectories in your like phase space kind of thing? Or yes. Be, yeah. so, so first, let me say, as I was saying before, it's not really an assumption. So you can show that when you optimize a protocol, I, I will come to this a bit later. So, but you can show that if you have um, a structureless bath, basically what happens is that the the protocols they become symmetric. Okay, so or more precisely, they become. Uh, so, if you look would look in in your parameter space, they, they they if you want the going the optimal protocol in the cold bath has the same shape, but of course in the other direction and and also the velocity gets renormalized that in the in the hot bath and this is true for and i will explain later but for baths that are uh, what i will call structureless if you have some structure on the bath then they are not quite 
the same, the, the optimal protocols, but they are related by this simple um, relation. So, so to answer your question, we are not really making an assumption, okay? So we, it just happens that when you look at optimal protocols, you get, you get this kind of nice uh, symmetries between the protocols that are in contact with a cold bath and the ones that are in contact with a hot bath. What we are assuming, and that's true, is that the, the way you couple to the bath is the same. Okay, so you, if you have bosonic bath, you, you always are coupled to bosonic bath. And by optimal, you mean this uh, optimization with respect to tau C and tau H? No, no, right. sorry. I mean the optimization uh, over protocols. Okay, so I'm really, I have my frequency or I have the parameters that I can change in the Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. And then I look, I, I want to understand how to optimally change the frequency uh in my working substance to get the most of power and uh yeah so so this is the kind of optimality that that i mean here okay thank you yeah thank you also for the question sorry um, you have another question yeah definitely hey uh hey marty just uh, uh, two kind of i think clarifications from my side one is that um, I always, um, you know, was criticized basically when I was doing arbitrary driving uh, with master equations. If you remember, we have this thermodynamic control paper from a couple of years ago. Yes. The criticism was always that the underlying master equations don't remain the same. Yeah. And, okay. uh, so this is one criticism I just want to highlight to you to see what your reaction. The mm -hmm. other is also that the dissipation, basically the linear response is one over tau. This is also in the slow regime, right? Yes. Because otherwise you have to keep the other one over tau square. Uh, yes, yes. So the so the so can you reconcile both of these uh, uh, the universality of the master equation and whether uh, you are doing slow enough driving that you still can keep the one over tau expansion as being valid? Yeah. So so thank you. It's, it's a very good point. Um, so indeed, I I will, I'm making this assumption that that the let's say I have a time dependent Hamiltonian, but still I assume that the instantaneous Gibbs state is the fixed point of, of my dynamics. So as, as you are suggesting, indeed, this is kind of in agreement with the type of pr protocols that we are looking at, because we are looking at slow protocols, whereas basically what you are assuming is that the time scale of your driving is slower, sorry, it's larger the time scale than the time scale of relaxation. So in this sense is where, where this approximation, it makes more sense. I see. So, yes, but I would say still, usually, I think as, as, long, as long as you have very uh, like fast dynamics in the bath, you can justify this even if your driving is pretty fast. Okay, so I, you, 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 it's really you have to make uh, some assumption of, of the response uh, of the bath. And then, I mean, I'm not saying this is always true, but in many relevant uh, cases it is. Especially Mar Marty, but in the contact. Markovian master equation derivation, you will run into these frequencies, you know, rotating to the frame already becomes a problem, no? This is yes, a, okay, uh, it's true. I mean, yes, yes, um, it's kind of, I'm looking at the, the abatic master equations, but it's true when you change the basis, this becomes more tricky, but at least when you consider that you are only changing the eigenvalues, this is uh, quite I well see. justified, okay. I think. And most of the protocols that I will consider is they are classical in a sense. But but yeah, indeed, it's, it's a good point to keep in mind. Um, okay, so I go back to this optimization of this quantity. So basically what I was arguing is that yes, you want to optimize this quantity over your control. And this was, uh, no, sorry. So so now I I, I need to, Indeed, if you want to optimize this, as Dario was saying, you, you need a, a you need to to give up if you want an universality and look more in the details. But I still try to keep the treatment quite general. So basically, you need to understand how this dissipation looks like. And in this low driving regime or low dissipation, what you are doing is a linear response expansion on on lambda dot on your control parameters. And then what you see is that uh, the dissipation or the work, it becomes a quadratic form in lambda dot, okay? So one lambda dot comes from the fact that you have the, the say the definition of work and the other one comes from the expansion 
of your state uh, for slow driving. So you know that you will always get this, this kind of expansions in the slow driving regime. So you will get a quadratic form in your velocities. And now this MIJ, this is the so-called uh, thermodynamic length. Okay, so this thermodynamic length is what governs how the, when you are driving at finite time in the slow driving. So, so it kind of tells you, it, it relates the, like your control parameters to the dissipation. Okay, so it kind of tells you how the system uh, responds uh, to when it's driven out of equilibrium, okay? Or if you want slowly out of equilibrium. So what is the form of this uh, MIJ of the thermodynamic length? So if you have macroscopic thermodynamics, then a very natural form is that it just kind of a susceptibility or a response function. And this goes back to the seminal papers on the thermodynamic length. So in this case, um, yeah, so it's kind of, if you want a textbook uh, result, but now you can ask, okay, but if I have a microscopic model, like can, can I use this expression or when is it uh, precisely true? And for example, this is discussed in this paper of Crookes that, well, this is the exact, if you do this slow driving uh, exactly from the equations of motion, then you would find this if your observables of interest, so your conjugated observables here, they would relax to equilibrium with uh, exponentially. So, sorry, I'm, I'm missing an H dot here, an X dot. So with this, I wanted to write the equation of motion, but okay, let's just look at the picture. So the idea is that if I would keep my dynamic, so if I would, I stop driving the system, okay, and I look at some point at the Hamiltonian space, then what I know is that my system will relax to equilibrium with a given time scale, which kind of makes sense because you are close to equilibrium. Okay, so the Markovian evolution and, and all, all these approximations that make sense. So when this is the case, well, then you can use uh, this nice expression, which also connects it to macroscopic thermodynamics, right? Because in macroscopic thermodynamics, we can have a very, very complicated uh, dynamics, but still the we can approximate it quite well, but I, by an exponential relaxation in, in many cases, not always, of course. And in this case, you can use this elegant expression. Now, more recently with uh, Matteo Scandi, we also look what happens when you have uh, this kind of uh, Limblad equation, sorry, where, where you have the Gibbs state as a fixed point. So basically what you can see here in a way, so before I had this relaxation time scale. So when you have a leap blood, you can diagonalize it and you get kind of many relaxation time scales. And then what you see is that your metric uh, gets this, this more complicated form, but basically this, this operator here, this lambda to the, uh, uh, sorry, this, uh, yes, this Limbladian to the minus one is, is taking into account the fact that you have many time scales. Okay, so, so this metric is really a generalization of, of the previous one, of this one where you have, uh, many time scales, many relevant time scales in your dynamics. So this is just to give a feeling of this can be. So you could also do, do this for for closed uh, systems where you do a kind of cubo linear response expansion. So this has been done, for example, by Liliana Rachea. So there, there are really many uh, frameworks that, but you can you always get this kind of form for the dissipation in the in the linear response regime. And this is our starting point, okay? We just assume this, and we assume this to be symmetric, which it is, and positive definite, which comes basically from the second law of thermodynamics or from Markovianity, okay? So this is our starting point. And then we want to optimize this, okay? So unfortunately, I don't have time to, to go to the proof, but let me just summarize the result. So first, let me just mention the simple case where you have a single relaxation time scale. Oh, I don't know. Ah, yes, then what we find, it's, it's quite simple actually. So we just choose the Cauchy's bars inequality. And what we prove is that this, this quantity is lower bounded by the, so if you fix a trajectory, so now I'm, I'm still not looking at the optimal protocols, I'm just fixing a trajectory then this quantity is upper bounded by the integrated heat capacity along the trajectory. Okay, so it's quite nice because it, you, you give me a protocol and then I tell you that the maximum power 
is lower bound. So the maximum power is at most the, heat the average heat capacity along the, the trajectory weighted by the time scale of relaxation. But this also, well, this can be saturated. And this also gives you a, a hint. I mean, it, it really tells you how to make optimal protocols because to make optimal protocols, what you want is to find a point in your parameter space where the heat capacity is maximized, actually the heat capacity divided by the, uh, by the time scale of equilibration, because this could also depend on, on your point. And then you find this maximum and you do cycles along this, this optimal point. Okay, so the, this is the idea of the optimal cycle. And it, it, as I was saying, it can be, I mean, these inequalities are tight. So if you want to saturate these Cauchy's bars, what you need is this property that uh, H dot uh, commutes with H. So you need uh, protocols of this form. And if you want to saturate this, you need to do your, your driving of the, of the Hamiltonian around the point where the heat capacity is maximized. And this gives you a, an upper bound on this quantity. So let me show, ah yes, before, let me just quickly mention that we can generalize this to any metric, okay? So you could take this general metric, but in fact, it can be done for anything that you plug in here, as long as you know this from, from you, you, you are able to derive this, this form, then we can show that this quantity is upper bounded by the, so this is kind of, if you want a kind of generalized heat capacity, I don't know how to call it, but it's a generalization of color function that we had before. So before we had this, uh, heat capacity over the time relaxation time scale, and now we have this uh, more complicated form that depends on the inverse of the metric. But what I want to stress this is that here is that this is just a scalar. Okay, maybe a bit complicated to compute, but this is a scalar, and then you want to maximize over your parameter space, and then the, again the optimal cycles will be slow variations around this optimal point. Okay, so maybe let me put uh, quickly an example. So imagine we again have this two level system and we can just drive, I mean, we can just change the energy and we can put it in contact with a bath. And then of course, I mean, you could really consider a lot of protocols. Okay, so you can change this uh, energy very fast or you can change it slowly or, or you can choose different functions on how to change it and so on and so forth. So this is a bit what we show here. So these are different protocols. So these are the final points of the, so this G is this dimensional energy. But the, the idea is that here we are taking different protocols and you can see that all protocols, they are upper bounded by the maximum of the heat capacity of this working substance. So this really gives you the, the idea of, of the, the power of this result because if I would just give you this system and tell you what is the optimal protocol. This is, of course, a hard problem, okay? Because you would need to find, like, optimize over all possible drivings and so on and so forth. But now what I'm telling you is, no, actually, you just have to look at the heat capacity of this two-level system, which is a trivial calculation, and see the point where it's maximized. And then you do the protocol around this point, okay? So, yeah, so I hope this example illustrates the result. And uh, yeah, so like a small summary. So we have this maximum power optimized over the time, which depends on this figure of merit that we can now uh, basically give an answer to. And it's, it's the, in the simplest case, it's the maximum heat capacity divided by the time scale given your control parameters. Okay, so some remarks. Um, this has been derived in the slow driving. Um, basically, we go from a functional maximization to a scalar one. And then the optimal point yeah, is independent of the figure of merit. And the optimal cycles have this point. Okay, so this is kind of the, the main ideas uh, of this talk. And with this, I, I move quickly to applications. I think I don't have much time left, so I, I will go through this fast. So this is again the two level system that I was mentioning. So we can give some expression for the maximum power of this finite time current engine, which complements the previous literature. But the point is that really with this framework, we can go beyond, okay? So here we were considering two uh, three level system, but 
the, I mean, this is a three by three or maybe nine by nine um, uh, master uh, equation. So, okay, it's not uh, trivial, but you can still look at this figure of merit. You can plot it as a function of your control parameters and just look at the maximum, okay? And here, for example, I'm comparing the maximum of this generalized, I mean, of the exact figure of merit with the maximum of the heat capacity. And you can see that they are pretty much the same, okay? So you can really take the heat capacity as over a time scale as a good figure of merit for how to optimize your power, which physically, of course, makes a lot of intuitive sense. And this um, uh, goes to one of the directions that I find most uh, exciting, which is this idea that so if you have a working substance made of many uh, interacting systems, sorry, many non-interacting systems, the power will just go linearly and the efficiency will stay the same, okay? If you do the same cycle on each of those. But then there were these nice papers by Alabertian and also by Campisi and Fazio where they uh, suggested this idea that if you have them interacting, and in particular, if they are close to a phase transition, then it could be that you could uh, while still having a linear power, you could try to send efficiency to Carnot uh, as you increase the number of particles, okay, by kind of exploiting these interactions between the, the particles. So this is a really an exciting idea, which is in our framework comes very naturally because we know that the maximum power is related to the maximum heat capacity. So let's now forget about the time scale. So we can just look at the maximum heat capacity. So this is, of course, very well studied in, in, in many body systems. So for example, we can take, compare a set of qubits with an interacting icing chain, and you see like this better uh, scaling, but still linearly with N. Now, if you would assume full control, it's known by this uh, very nice paper by Rip and Wolf and also by Luis, that the, the, the configuration that maximizes the heat capacity is this bit crazy, uh, set up where you have uh, an effective two-level system with a lot of degeneracy and then you can get this n squared scaling for the heat capacity which basically would mean that you have linear power and efficiency going as one over n to Carnot with this system but maybe the message that i want to send is that it's kind of a nice nice uh, playground to, to yeah so a nice framework to play between thermodynamics and, and many body because it's, it, the figures of merit uh, become quite simple. And, and, and it, they really, meet, it's really, you know, you are optimizing over overall protocol. So this, this difficult uh, part, you can just forget about it and just focus more on the, on the many body aspects. So with this, I come to an end. So yeah, I think basically let me just mention that, that, as I said at the beginning, this has been published here. And we also have this kind of continuation work that um, I also recommend to you. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thanks, Marty, for the, for the wonderful talk. I really liked it. Um, I think we have three questions. Uh, first one coming from Mohammed Bobakor. So if you want to ask your question directly, that would be great. Uh, hello. Yeah, uh, it was talk. Uh, just wanted to know, like, for example, if you want to look at the efficiency at maximum uh, work output, uh, yeah. how different it would be from the efficiency of mat maximum power? Ah, I see. So efficiency, but this efficiency and maximum work output, like, naively, I would expect this is the Carnot efficiency because the Carnot efficiency has... Um, finite work output but and it has i mean the power is zero but the work output is finite and then the efficiency is carnot so i'm not sure how how this efficiency at maximum uh, work output maybe in the auto cycle is is uh, non-trivial but i think in the in the say carnot cycle or finite time carnot cycle this is just a carnot efficiency so I don't know if this was your question. Uh, yeah, because no, because I was just thinking like because the power is basically the work output you get divided by unit time, unit time scale. Yes. So I was just wondering like if you just say okay, I optimize 
just work and I put the time scale to one, would I get some? Well, no, no, notice that the power is the, the work divided by the time of the cycle. Okay, not the time scale. And, and if you j just optimize the work output, then in a way you can take the time of your cycle to infinity. And, and, and then you will just get the Carnot, yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, welcome. Dario? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, sorry, can you go to the uh, slide previous, to the previous slide? Yes. Uh, sorry, I'm not understanding. I mean, um, mm -hmm. from the plot, it looked like that you have some super linear scaling, but this is not reflected into a power or am I? Um, it's uh, a very subtle point. <laughs> and actually our first um, version of the archive is wrong um, because yes, you, you would think that if you have, the, I mean, Okay, sorry, I didn't have time to explain this, mm -hmm. and I should have because th this this uh, expression is completely fine as long as you are not close to a phase transition point. Okay, then you, you have to be very careful, uh, and this we we missed in the in the first version because the point. Um, so I got very confused by this when I was working on this. Like, if you would look at the, okay, sorry, uh, maybe. It was not a good idea. But if you look at the, you just take the expression for the, you just take this, okay, the power mm -hmm. of the current engine. Well, you see delta S, if you have N systems, can go at most linearly. Right. So there is no way that the power can go super extensively with your working substance, wow. which is very confusing because then you look at this and you say, I know that this depends on the maximum and you know that the heat cap, that the, that the heat capacity can go super extensively. Well, the point is that if you, I mean, this is also discussed in this paper of Campisi and Fazio, if you want to do the cycle at the point where you have the phase transition, you also have to you do your cycle smaller and smaller, okay? Because mm -hmm. you have to get closer. I mean, you have this kind of finite size uh, critical scaling. So you have to make your cycle uh, uh, slower and slower. And if you want to keep uh, everything consistent with your slow driving uh, approximation and everything, what you mm -hmm. see is that basically what you need to be in this point, sorry, is that you also need to, to send this, this parameter because, okay, so it's a, as I was saying, it's a really a subtle thing. Uh, okay, I didn't write, but if you would look at the optimal time, you would see that you also need to send the time to Infinity, so you, you need to send this, this parameter here to Carnot, okay? So, so if you want to be, what I'm trying to say is that if you want to be consistent, to, mm. to remain inside the critical scaling and, and be consistent with the slow driving approximation, you need to go to Carnot as you go to the, to the as, you, as you do this, this optimal cycle. So can I, can I take as a take home message that you can have a super linear scaling of the power, but the price to pay is that you have no efficiency at all? No, no, sorry, no. Yeah. sorry, I was, it was very confusing my answer. No, the, the, the take home message is that you cannot have a super extensive scaling of power. I see, okay, but, because you say gamma. Uh... Yes, but you can have the, the, the efficiency going to Carnot and the power staying linear. I see. Okay, got it, got it. And, and the okay. second take of message is that be careful about this expression okay. in a phase transition. Sure. Because as it is now, it's not correct. Like you, you, need, a, a, you need to be careful you, to take this gamma. This gamma will also depend on N, okay? Mm -hmm. In a phase transition. Okay, sure. So somehow you say this gamma cancel the yes. super linear part of the, okay. So that the power will stay linear, but the efficiency, because this gamma also enters into the efficiency, like that this is the efficiency, the, the efficiency go, will go like one over N. And then it's you are consistent with uh, your approximations. Yeah, thank you very much for, for the question, because it, it's in the just, start a, just a small follow up. I mean, you it look that somehow the system that, ah, no, okay. You mean in order to, have, because anyway, this is a great uh, improvement, let's say a quantum improvement, it is, it has to do with the criticality. I mean, you need to be at the critical point, am I right? Yes, yes, exactly. You need a, well, it can be in a classical phase, and like a second order phase transition. Okay. Yeah. okay, got it, thanks, yeah. Yeah, welcome. Thanks a lot also for the question. Okay, thanks, Dario. And uh, I think Matthew also has a question. 
Hey, uh, thanks for the nice talk. I just have a, a basic question. Uh, may you provide some intuition on why the maximum power is proportional to the, um, the heat capacity and inversely proportional to the equilibrium time, the time they yeah. reach equilibrium? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So actually, I mean, physically, the, this this uh, has a very strong intuition, and I guess this is what what drove uh, Campisi and Fazio because in this nice paper, they they don't optimize, but they also look at, at power of auto engines that that goes proportional to this. So basically, the idea is that first it's clear that you want your your bath to relax fast your system, okay? Because then you can do your your cycle uh, quickly. So you want to, this equilibration time scale to, to be small. And then the, the heat capacity basically tells you when you change the temperature, so you, when you go to one bath to the other, how much heat, like how much energy you, you need coming from, from the bath. So you also want this to be fast, okay? So you want a system that relaxes very fast, but that, that also uh, injects a lot of uh, energy out of the bath. Okay, so it takes a lot of energy or gives a lot of energy from to the bath because your your work output basically it's it depends on on this. Okay, so so this is a bit the intuition. And what is interesting is that usually in many body, almost always these two things they are inversely proportional. Okay, so so when you go to a phase transition or yeah, so you when you have a very large heat capacity. Then the price to pay is uh, usually a large uh, thermalization time scale. Okay, so it, I'm putting this under the carpet in this in this plot because here I'm not looking at the time scale of relaxation. But I think this is really an interesting question, like how these two things or how this ratio can be optimized, let's say, in realistic uh, systems. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Also. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let's thank Marty for, for the nice talk and all the... Thank you a lot. Okay, so, um, so now the question comes to, should we uh, take a five minute break before going on to the third talk? Is there someone who is desperate for a break or should we just charge on? <laughs> mm -hmm. 